Uh, we've taken a break from, uh, we began our sermon series last week, um, Doctrines of Grace, and we're looking at the Reformation. And uh, I'll continue with that next week. Um, but this morning I thought to bring you a, a topical sermon on the matter of uh, the evil of pride, uh, the evil of pride. And so uh, that's what we'll be addressing this morning, and I do hope that uh, um, you will be blessed and encouraged, and uh, also uh, we hope that the Lord will um, direct us this morning, and uh, we will uh, listen and obey His Word this morning. And so um, let's go to Acts chapter 12 for the reading of God's Word, um, Acts chapter 12, and we'll begin at verse, um, we we'll want to focus on verse 20 to 24, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the entire chapter. So Acts chapter 12, and let us stand for the reading of God's Word, if you'll guess with us. Uh, we stand for the reading of God's Word for the sermon and for at the beginning of the service. Uh, Acts chapter 12, and uh, we'll look at verse from verse 1 onwards. <clears throat> so here is the reading of God's Word for the sermon on the Lord's Day morning. May Spirit of life come to attention for this purpose, and may all who have gathered as guests this morning also stand in attention for the reading of God's Word. Here is the reading of God's Word. Acts chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And when he saw that he pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. It was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, de delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. And so Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and the light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter's side and woke him up, saying, Get up quickly. His chains fell off his hands, and the angel said to him, Gird yourself and, and put on your sandals, and he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow, and he did not know uh, that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has set forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people who were expecting. So from all that the Jewish people were expecting. Verse 12, And when he realized this, he went uh, to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked on the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came uh, to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind, but she kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying, it is, it's his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. Motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison. And he said, report these things to James and the brethren. And then he left and went to another place. And when the day, uh, when the day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as to what could have become of Peter. So when Herod had searched for him and, and not found him, he, ex he examined the guards and ordered that they be led away to execution. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and was spending time there. Now he was very angry with the people of, of Ty and, and uh, Sidon, and with one accord they came to him, and having won over Blastus the king's chamberlain, they were asking for peace because their country was, was, was fed by the king's country. On an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. And the people kept crying out, This is a voice of a god and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory and was eaten by worms and died. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and be multiplied. This is the reading of God's word. The sermon of the church said, Amen. Amen. 
So a great joy once again to bring you God's word and the title of my sermon on this Lord's Day morning is The Evil of Pride, The Evil of Pride. Now the main character here in from verses 20 onwards is Herod, King Herod. Now you know of King Herod, we see in the previous verses in the chapter how he killed James uh, with the sword and he imprisoned Peter. Uh, there is much to speak on there, and I probably will at another time, maybe at the Lord's Day evening, uh, be able to talk with you more and bring you more on the, the great crisis that faced that church because of the preaching of the gospel. And it must be made clear, my friends, that uh, any church that's willing to go with the flow, any church that's willing to be a cork, uh, that's being tossed to and fro in the ocean of philosophy, uh, being caught up with every whimsical tide that man brings will not face persecution. But a church that is resolute in standing upon God's word and boldly proclaiming God's word and not being ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but declaring that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. This is an exclusive message, an exclusive gospel. Such church will definitely face persecution, will definitely face imprisonment, will definitely face all kinds of attack. And we see that here. Herod uh, kills James with the sword. He imprisons Peter. At the end of Acts 12, Luke takes time to tell us a little bit more about Herod and what eventually happened to him. I believe that what happened to Herod is an important part of the story. So we're going to look at this uh, on the Lord's Day morning. And uh, like I said, the title of my sermon is The Evil of Pride. Now, before I get into this, before I get into this, I want to uh, let you know of another name that I'll be introducing to the sermon today. Uh, it's a name not found in your Bible, so don't, be, uh, don't think that we're not teaching from the Bible. I'm bringing to you a, a historical context. Um, so there is the, uh, the scriptural context from the book of Acts chapter 12, and, but I, there's also the historical context. In other words, when you read church history, you find a particular context as to what was happening at that time. So I'm going to bring you the historical context as well. And as I do that, I'm going to introduce you to a man uh, called, uh, called Titus Flavius Josephus. Uh, if you're a student of church history, if you read a little bit more than um, uh, uh, about church history, you would have come across this man, Titus Flavius Josephus. Now, he was uh, uh, a man who was uh, born in AD 37, and uh, uh, this is about uh, four years after uh, the, the, the crucifixion of Jesus. And at an early age, Josephus showed a keen mind to learn. He later came and uh, uh, he, later, he later became a Jewish scholar and a, a first century historian. His most famous work is called The Antiquities of the Jews. And that's where I recognize him from, The Antiquities of the Jews. And it is in that Antiquities of the Jews where Jesus is mentioned a number of times, many times, does Josephus mention him. His Antiquities of the Jews is recognized as one of the earliest pieces of historical evidence for Jesus outside the New Testament. So we're going to make mention of him in a few minutes, and when I do that, you'll know who I'm talking about and how it has bearing on Acts, uh, on Acts chapter 12. Now let's go to our text. Let's read verse 20. Our text says in verse 20, uh, Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace, because their country depending on the king's country for food. Now, let's set the scene here. In verse 17, we find that Peter, had, after being miraculously released from prison and visiting those who have been praying for him, he now disappears from the scene. Peter disappears from the scene. We don't hear of him. And then in verse 20, we are reintroduced to Herod. And we find that uh, Herod now, uh, there's an issue between the people of Tyre and Sidon and Herod. And he's angry with them for some reason. Herod is angry with them for some reason. Uh, uh, and this is now several months, historically, this is now several months after Peter's miraculous release. Now what the exact issue was and why uh, this king was angry with the people, we do not know. Uh, Luke does not tell us. But what we, knew, what we do know is that there was a relationship between the people of Tyre and Sidon and Herod. 
And the people of Tyre and Sidon relied heavily upon Herod. They were dependent on him. They were dependent on his government for food supply. And now the relationship is under stress. Something had threatened the peace between Herod and them. And verse 20 says, they came to Herod asking for peace. So we know that the peace was being threatened. They came to Herod asking for peace. Why? Uh, so that they could get the food supply restored back to their people. So what we see here then is a, a kind of desperate people who would say or do anything because their food supply was at stake. In the later verses, we see how far they would go in their desperation to, to the point where they would appease Herod's ego and pride by calling him a god. So the people of Tyre and Sidon work their way to Herod by first getting to Herod's chamberlain. Who is a chamberlain? What is a chamberlain? A chamberlain is the king's spokesman or one who is closest to the king. Here the chamberlain called Blastus convinces Herod to see the representatives of Tyre and Sidon. Herod agrees, right? He agrees, but he agrees on his terms. He sees them on the day that he appoints, a day that he sets to show all the people, including those of Tyre and Sidon, who he is. And Luke does not tell us more of this day. But according to Josephus, who I mentioned a few minutes ago, when we look at the historical context, we read a little bit of church history, we read a little bit of first century church history, um, we find that he, Josephus says that there was an, amph an amphitheater and the amphitheater was full of people who were feasting in honor of Herod's faithfulness to the Roman Empire. So Herod set this all up. It was a feast in honor of Herod's faithfulness to the Roman Empire. They meet in the amphitheater built by Herod's grandfather. He was Herod the Great, if you remember that. And, and it is here that, that, that Herod now puts on his his grand show before the people. Let's look at verse 21 onwards. On an appointed day. So this is the day that Herod is appointing. Uh, on an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an, 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 an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Now, in his Antiquities of the Jews, uh, Josephus records this day for us. He tells us that Herod, on this appointed day, puts on royal robes. A garment, when he says royal robes, is a garment made entirely of silver. Now, that's not in, your, in the book of Acts chapter 12, but that's from the historical context. This is Josephus talking from first century history, telling us that on this day, it was a garment made entirely of silver. Then at an appointed time, so here's Herod in his garment full of silver, uh, entirely of silver. Then at, a, at an appointed time, a time picked by Herod himself, he enters into the amphitheater and at that particular time chosen by him, the sun shone down into the amphitheater in a particular way and the rays of the sun hit his royal garment. The rays of the sun hit that full silver garment and the entire garment illuminated. Josephus goes on to record that the people were overwhelmed by this splendor. Here Herod, Herod walks into the amphitheater at a specific time. The sun shines down. His entire garment illuminates. The people are in splendor. This is a show that Herod is putting on. Drawing attention to himself. Showing something uh, more than what he really is. The people were in awe of him. Josephus goes on uh, to record that the people were overwhelmed by this splendor. Then, having come in, Herod makes his speech and as the people stood in the reflection of his splendor, and this is not the splendor of God, this is, Joseph, this is a Herod making up this splendor. Everything is choreographed. And he makes a statement, he comes in and his speech begins as he stands before the people. 
And they cried out. The people cried out as they, as they heard him speak. They said, oh, this is the voice of God and not of a man. What had just happened? Well, Herod had achieved what he'd set out to do. He'd achieved on that day the goal. And what was the goal in the eyes of the people? He was a God. He wanted to declare himself as God, hail himself as God. And that's what happened. Verse 23 says, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. What an awful way to die. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. So Luke tells us the fate of Herod. He was killed because he failed to give glory to God. He failed to give glory to God. And here we, see, here we see very, very clearly Herod's pride and his arrogance. It was his pride and his arrogance that brought him to this place. When the people shouted out the voice of a God and not of a man, Herod did not shut them up. He did not quiet them down. He did not mute them. He did not rebuke them. He did not correct them. He did not say to them, no, 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 please do not say that I am a God. Please, there is only one true and living God and it's not me. Herod didn't say that. No, instead, what did he do? He took the glory for himself. He kept quiet and he took the glory for himself. He could have very easily said, there is only one true God and I am not him. But he did not. He took the glory for himself. Now, if you're listening to this in the chapel today, or you're listening to this by way of the broadcast or the recording, you may say, well, pastor, maybe he did not rebuke them or correct them because he himself did not know the true and living God. That may be a, you may think that's a valid position or a valid argument to make. Why be so hard on Herod? He doesn't know the true and living God. It may be that he doesn't know the true and living God. But I submit to you, my dear friends, even if you say that he was not a Christian, he was not a believer, I submit to you today that he is without excuse about who the true and living God is. As every man today is without excuse about who the true and living God is. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans and keep your bookmark on, on Acts 12 and uh, go with me uh, to the book of Romans. And uh, we'll read from Romans 1. Uh, in, we'll read in Romans 1, sorry. And we'll begin from verse 18 to verse 25. Romans 1 tells us, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and, and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. Let's just repeat that. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them already. Huh? Can you not see that? That which is known about God is already evident within them for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory, uh, exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that, their, uh, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Paul is making the case here in this most crucial part of Romans at the beginning, at the onset, at the springboard into the book of Romans, which is a fabulous, fabulous uh, uh, book on uh, salvation. Uh, he he makes, it, makes it very clear that, 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 that the sinner man is without excuse. Absolutely without excuse. The sinner man cannot say on the day of judgment, I did not know you, God. I did not hear about you. I did not know who you are. Paul is making clear that every man knows who God is. 
When we stand in the public square, when we stand in broad mead, uh, the young person or the older person would come up and say, can you prove to me that God exists? And I say, I don't have to prove to you that God exists because you know that God exists. Romans 1 tells us that you know that God exists. And very often I make it clear, as I do uh, many, many times, and I preach and I say, you know, uh, even uh, though you have not read the Bible, you look up at the sky. Uh, on, on, on Wednesday night as we were preaching outside the nightclub in Bristol and these students were going past and the man was making the case. He said, if I look up at the sky today, where can I see God? And I let him speak for five minutes and I took his very words that he spoke. And I said, as you look, as you look up at the sky today, what do you see? He says, I see stars. I said, who put the stars there? He said, well, they just came by evolution. And I said, well, let's explain what evolution is. And he went on to try to explain how something, life, can come from nothing. And then saw in his reasoning, as I reasoned with him, that it is impossible that life cannot come from non-life. Because that's what, that's what evolutionism is. Evolution... Evolutionism on its foundation uh, uh, supports the idea uh, that nothing produces something. It's impossible. Darwin and Dawkins and Hawkins have all agreed with that. It's scientifically impossible. You cannot get life from non-life. So where do you get life from? You get life from life. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God. It comes from God. And so when you look up at the stars at night... You have to ask, who put it there? How did it get there? It's proof that God exists. And further to that, we say to the people who ask about God and deny the existence of God, we say, no, but you do know that God exists. How can you say that, preacher? Well, we say, well, you know, when you are rounding that corner at 90 miles an hour and your car goes off the rails and you're about to hit that tree, uh, who are you calling upon? Boris Johnson? European Union, your favorite philosopher, Nietzsche, Voltaire, Descartes, who are you calling upon as your car hits that corner at 90 miles an hour and you see the tree in front of you and you can see your life flash before your eyes? I know who you're calling on, God. The same God who you deny. When you're on that hospital bed and they're diagnosing you with cancer and all sorts of other things, who are you calling upon? Rihanna, Beyonce, Justin Timberlake, who are you calling upon? Your lyrical philosophers to help you in life? No, I know who you're calling on, God. So you know who God is, but you're denying him as Romans 1 tells us. You suppress him in your unrighteousness. Here we feel, my friend, that Herod is without excuse. His family line, Herod's family line shows that he had knowledge of God. He had knowledge of God. Surely he knew of his grandfather. He knew of his grandfather who killed thousands of babies in the fear of the newborn king. Surely he knew of his father who killed John the Baptist. Uh, and, and when we know that John the Baptist was a righteous man and a holy man, Jesus said there is no prophet like John the Baptist. But his father killed John the Baptist. And now in his life, Herod uh, 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 surely knew, uh, had knowledge of the true and living God. What does he do? We read in Acts chapter 12, he has appointed, uh, he was the one who has appointed the four squads of soldiers to guard Peter. Yet neither the prison nor the guards could keep Peter captive. Peter's God. Peter's God. The one true and living God set Peter free. Surely this was a sign of the one true and living God to Herod. But apart from that, like we said, Romans 1 tells us that God is evident all around us in the world. The truth is visible, but man has chosen to suppress that truth. Romans 1 tells us that the, uh, the, there has been a universal, there is a universal revelation of God which has reached everyone and everywhere in every age and in every time. No man, every man is without excuse. There is no man in any time, age or season that says that he doesn't know who God is. No one has ever lived without the knowledge of God. For what can be known of God is plain to them. God has made it plain to them. God has shown it to them as Romans 1 tells us. And this is the most amazing thing. God took the initial step to let man know who he is. And to let man know what he is like. God has shown himself to man. Isn't that the one that you get asked all the time? Well, we get certainly asked that all the time. 
If your God is true, let him show himself to me. When you say God has already shown himself to you. You know he exists. He's shown himself to you. He's shown himself to you in creation. He's shown himself to you in your conscience. And he's shown himself to you through his revealed will. God has shown himself to you already. So even if you do not have a Bible or own a Bible, you already know that God exists by looking out at this Sunday afternoon's sky or Sunday morning sky. So there is no man that is without excuse. Every man knows that God exists. God took the initial responsibility to let man know that he exists. And ever since the creation of the world, man has known this. God's invisible nature has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. This creation, this nature. Hmm. We give various excuses and reasons as to how they came about. But those reasons fall in the court of reality. When you hold it up, when you hold an evolutionism idea, when you hold an atheistic idea or a humanist idea or a secularist idea against the light, you find that it collapses. It is worth nothing. It diminishes. It's like vapor. It's like smoke that quickly disappears. There is no truth in it. The truth is that it is God who created life. And in nature, we see who the true and living God is. So is there anybody, we may ask the question, is there anybody who lived in the past who, do, who, who did not have knowledge of God? Is there anybody living today who does not have knowledge of God? Even if they're living in the most remote part of the world, uh, where no missionary or evangelist has ever gone to reach them, are they still without excuse? Well, Paul tells us that God has already revealed himself to them, even without the missionary, even without the evangelist. I believe that all, even those who cannot see, cannot hear, or cannot speak, God has revealed himself already to them. I will repeat that for those who cannot see, who cannot hear, or cannot speak, God has already revealed himself to them. And I'll give you by way of example what I mean by that. The story of Helen Keller, if you've read Helen Keller, if you read her uh, a short bite-sized type of poetry and, and things like that, if you're familiar with Helen Keller, you'll be very familiar with her writings. Helen Keller wrote something that my, uh, my, my, my dear aunt, who has gone to be with the Lord, she spoke it into my ears when we were married in 1989. And I remember those words very clearly. And I, I speak it at almost every wedding that I conduct uh, that marriage is the bliss of the moment. Uh, well, sorry, wedding is the bliss of the moment, but marriage is the work of a lifetime. That the wedding will, will be gone and the people will disappear, but the marriage, the marriage is the one that goes on. And I remember those words. Those are Helen Keller's words. So the story of Helen Keller is most, most remarkable. Helen Keller was a woman who, uh, as, a, as an infant, lost her sight and, uh, and her hearing and her ability to speak. There was a lady called Miss Sullivan who, in a most dedicated ministry of love reached through the darkness and silence of the soul of this dear girl Helen and brought her uh, into the knowledge of man and the earth and all that man knows. Thus Helen Keller became one of the greatest women of modern times. She recorded that uh, there came a time when Miss Sullivan, being a very godly woman uh, uh, and a wonderful Christian, wanted to impart to Helen some truth about God. So Miss Sullivan, being a good Christian and wanting to do this, went to see a man called Dr. Philip Brooks and asked him to come and tell Miss Keller about God. As Dr. Brooks sat there, he talked to Miss Sullivan and Miss Sullivan then translated the words to Helen Keller through the finger pressures that she used for communication. As she got across the idea about God, suddenly a light broke on Miss Keller's face and she answered back in her way, Oh, I know him, she said. I know him and I've known him for a very, very long time, she said. How did she know him? She was blind. She was deaf. She could not speak. How did she know him? Well, I think her story is one of the many testimonies of the wonderful confirmation that even 
in the heart of someone who has no eyes to see or ears to hear or mouth to speak, there is a written revelation of God in the heart of that person. That's what Romans 1 tells us. We see that in Romans 1. So from Romans 1, we see that Herod is without excuse. And so are the millions of others today without excuse. Herod, having knowledge of the one true God, accepts the praise of the people that he is God when they say to him that he is God. Luke says, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down. Let's go back to Acts 12. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms. Now, when it says that Herod did not give glory to God, what do we mean? What does that mean? What does it mean to glorify God? That's a good question. To glorify God means to give glory to him. Simple, right? The word glory as related to God in the Old Testament uh, bears witness with the idea uh, of greatness and splendor. That's what we see in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the word translated uh, glory means dignity. It means honor. It means praise. It means worship. So when we put together the Old Testament uh, meaning and the New Testament meaning, we find when we put those words together, we find that glorifying God means to acknowledge his greatness and to give him honor by praising and worshiping him primarily, primarily because he and he alone deserves to be praised, honored and worshiped. God's glory is the essence of his nature and we give him glory by recognizing that essence. You know, question one of the Westminster Catechism, question one says or asks this, what is the chief aim? What is the chief end? What is the chief purpose of man? And you know the answer, right? The answer, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Man's chief purpose is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Man's chief purpose is not that he may accumulate wealth. Man's chief purpose is not that he may be, uh, that he may conquer the earth. Man's chief purpose is not that he may build multiple companies or high rise buildings. Man's chief purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Man's chief purpose is to acknowledge God's greatness and to give him honor and by, honor by praising him and worshiping him. So here in Acts chapter 12, the evil of pride is shown here in Herod's life. He takes the glory. He takes the glory that is reserved for God. It is man who offers the sacrifice of praise to God. It is man who glorifies God. And not man who is praised and glorified. Next month as we continue in our Doctrines of Grace series. You will see in one of the five solas. We say glory to God alone. Let's look back at our text again. Immediately the angel of the Lord struck him down. And because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. What an awful picture that is. Now Josephus recorded that although Herod was struck immediately by the angel, he did not die immediately. This is the historical context. The phrase eaten by worms in the Greek gives us a better understanding of what happened to him. Now, I thought about bringing you the Greek words um, so that you can see how I came to this conclusion. Uh, so when he says the phrase eaten by Worms in the Greek gives a better understanding of what happened to him. Um, I find it's fairly complicated in trying to bring it forth, but uh, I will sum it up by saying this. It's, it's, it's the root words here that indicate that Herod had some sort of internal disease that resulted in worms in his body. And those worms then bursting forth into other worms ate him up from the inside. Each worm was about 40 centimeters. That's about 40 centimeters in length. This was a serious case of abdominal pain, right? Some very serious abdominal pain. He was literally being eaten from the inside. He was literally being eaten from the inside. He was literally being eaten alive. 
So according to Josephus, Herod lives a few days and whilst alive, he suffered greatly. And this was the most shameful way to die, to be eaten by worms. I believe when James died, when, when, when Herod killed James, James died with great honor and integrity. Dying for the Lord. His head was taken off with a sword, dying for the Lord. And this is the way Herod dies. He dies in suffering, being eaten by worms, being eaten alive. The way this happened, the way God has orchestrated this proves in yet another way that he alone is God. And that he alone gets the glory. He proves also that there is a judgment on those who dare wage war against God. A judgment of those who dare wage war against his holy church. A judgment of those who dare come against his bride. If you want to know more about that and the context of the previous verses, uh, look at a sermon that I preached called The Church in Crisis. And you'll find it on our website under sermons, uh, under media, uh, under sermons, you'll find a sermon called The Church in Crisis. And I speak in a sermon of the, of the ongoing war against God. On a spiritual level, the war began with Lucifer and his angels. Lucifer was the highest day of, of the creation and, the, and, and, and he rebelled against God. He rebelled against the creator. Lucifer is called Satan, which is adversary, which is enemy, which is challenger, which is rival in its root meaning. So God cast him out and, and, and one third of the rebellious angels out of heaven with him. From that moment to this day, war has raged between Satan and God. And that war involves and works through angels and men, angels and man. On a human level, the battle began when Adam and Eve rebelled against God by eating the forbidden fruit. They chose to listen to Satan rather than obey God. And through the centuries, men have, have shaken their fists against God. And as, as one commentator wrote, and I quote, he says, Sinful man, they pit their, their impotence against his omnipotence, shattering themselves like raw eggs against granite. That's how foolish sinful man is. Thinking that you could fight against the omnipotence of God. And history is filled with such people, my dear friends. History is filled with such people. The 19th century philosopher, Frederick Nietzsche, I spoke of him at the beginning of my sermon. Frederick Nietzsche hated Christians. He hated Christians. He called them a religion of weaklings. Fighting God finally pushed him over the edge. And he spent the last years of his life insane, clinically insane. Nobel Prize winning author, Ernest Hemingway, who is famous for his books like The Old Man and the Sea and For Whom the Bell Tolls, thought of himself as the living proof uh, that God does not exist, that you could fight against God. In all of his confessions, he boasted of fighting in revolutions. He boasted of his sexual relationships with women. He boasted of the sin in his life. And he said, I can sin without consequence. He, well, his sins found him out. And one day he put a shotgun to his head and killed himself. In the Bible we'll see many, many who thought that they could wage war against God. They were mainly kings and rulers who were drunk on their own power and deceived into thinking that they could war against God. Oh, how we cry in the public square, how we plead with sinners in the public square to stop blaspheming God. Stop using those words and cussing and swearing against God because you're waging war against God. And woe to you young people, woe to you older people, woe to you men and women of Bristol who wage war against God. One of the first examples we see of this waging war against God is in Exodus in the account of Moses and Pharaoh. Pharaoh was convinced that his word is final. And nothing overrides his word. And he can override anything that God says. Well, even though God showed Pharaoh the signs of the plagues. And the killing of the firstborn. Pharaoh refused to listen. And he continued down the path of waging war with God. Pharaoh fought until his armies were drowned in the Red Sea. Sadly my friends. Sadly 
The Bible also shows us many of God's people who waged war against God. Their outcome was the same as the others. And Solomon said this in Proverbs 21.30. He said this. So it's, he said this. He said, there is no wisdom and no understanding and no counsel against the Lord. There is no wisdom, no understanding and no counsel against the Lord. The shameful death here of Herod in Acts proves the judgment of God against those who try to wage war against God's divine plan by waging war against his elect. As he drew to a conclusion here in the, 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 the book of Acts chapter 12, Luke makes this clear. He brings to the conclusion the end here, the concluding of Herod's life. He dies the most awful death being eaten by worms, being eaten alive. But as we bring to the conclusion of Herod's life, we bring to a conclusion of this chapter something most glorious. In verse 24, Luke tells us, but the word of God increased and multiplied. Amen. The word of God increased and multiplied. The word of God increased and multiplied. What a glorious end to this chapter. James is killed by the sword. Peter is imprisoned. The church is in crisis. The church goes into hiding. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why when you go back and look at the sermon where Peter tries to quieten them down. Don't tell everybody that I'm, I'm being released. Why? Because it's very much like the church has gone underground for a moment and a time. And Peter wants to save them from further persecution. And in this time, in this time of great persecution against this church, in the time when people are talking in their prayer groups, hey, did you hear what happened to James? He was killed with a sword. Must we continue preaching? Should we not hold it back a little bit? Should we not apply some wisdom here and uh, uh, close the church and shut it down? Maybe go online for a while so that we take the attention away. Look what's happened to our brother James. He tried preaching the gospel and he got killed. And look at our other brother Peter. He tried preaching the gospel. Look what happened to him. He's imprisoned. We without an apostle, we have nobody to lead us. Ah, but they didn't. They didn't. Look at what God does in verse 24. But the word of God increased and multiplied. Amen. The word of God increased and multiplied. The word of God increased and multiplied. James was killed, Peter imprisoned, and then miraculously released. In all of this, the purpose of God seemed to have been stalled. The purpose of God seemed to have been brought to an end by the prison or a sword of Herod. But we find as we end the, end the chapter, the word of God increased and multiplied. We thought the church was on a downward spiral. We thought the church was coming to an end. Maybe Herod and the rest of the people were rejoicing that the church was coming to an end. That they were dealing with this people called the way. Ah, but something interesting happens. Verse 24, but the word of God increased and multiplied. The Holy Spirit was at work within the church, drawing believers to the word, drawing believers to the word. It says the word of God increased. The preaching of God's word, the authority of God's word, the sharing of God's word increased and it multiplied. What a great testimony that is. What a great testimony that is that we can say that the word of God is increasing. The word of God is multiplying. Not us, not our ways, but the word of God increased and multiplied. The Holy Spirit was working in the church, drawing believers to the word of God. Their reading, their study, their preaching and of the word increased rather than decreased. Oh, I find this to be most encouraging to the church today. Most encouraging to me in the pulpit today and I pray it is encouraging to you. Their reading increased, their study increased, their preaching increased. The word increased and multiplied rather than decreased. This increase was manifested by spiritual growth, spiritual maturity in the believers. And I do believe the multiplied also there by implication would be that the, the numbers in the church multiplied. And this is God advancing his work, advancing his will. This is God advancing for his glory. For his glory. 
I bring the sermon to an end and I want to leave you with this encouraging quote by Derek Thomas. Derek Thomas is a man I deeply respect as a Bible teacher. Derek Thomas says this and I, and I quote, he says, these men and women talked scripture, preached scripture, sang scripture and witnessed scripture. This was church growth, New Testament style. They had no demographic research, no statistical analysis of the most likely elements of society to respond to the gospel, no evangelism training, no extensive campaigns of one kind. And yet, and yet, under the blessings of God and in the midst of persecution that had been, that had seen the execution of one of their most prized leaders, the church grew, end quote. How deeply stirring and troubling at the same time that quote is. He makes a point here of saying, uh, uh, Derek Thomas makes the point of saying that no demographic research, no people gone out to do a study. Let's have a study of Lockleys and see what it's like. Let's have a study of Fulton and see what kind of people there are. Maybe they're working class, maybe they're students, whatever. Nothing. Who are the most likely to respond to our evangelism? Let's do a study, let's do a survey. Nothing. No evangelism training, no extensive campaigns of one kind or another, yet under the blessings of God and the midst of persecution. And in that persecution, it's seen one of the most prized leaders killed. The church grew, the word of God continued. May the Lord help us as we understand this text. Let us pray.